In the heart of the Middle East, something ominous is happening. The prophecies that have been whispered for centuries are finally beginning to reveal themselves, and the signs are too alarming to ignore. In this video, we will examine more closely the unsettling happenings around Al-Aqsa and the strange coincidences that appear to be occurring. Join me as we explore the terrifying Al-Aqsa prophecies that are happening right now. Syria is one of the holiest sites on the planet. The most sacred part of Syria is Palestine. The most sacred part of Palestine is Jerusalem. The most sacred part of Jerusalem is the Noble Sanctuary. And the most sacred part of the Noble Sanctuary is Majid al-Aqsa. The arrival of Islam and the Messenger of Allah brought light into a dark world and hope to people who had been depressed. He was the messenger of good news. The messenger of Allah foretold of events that will befall this Ummah. Some of these stories talk about the evil that will happen and how it will separate us from Allah, the highest, and make us feeble in front of the nations. We are now living witnesses to many of these events. During such times, it is easy to ignore and neglect the good that is also about to happen in terms of a future, power, and honor for the Muslims who will be well established in the land. We can observe from the example and life of the Prophet of Allah that he was a hopeful and optimistic person. Much like the beginning of his messengers, which came to the darkest place on earth during the darkest period of human history, we find that during his life, when all seemed lost, when the citadel of darkness had been stormed by the forces of evil and treachery, the messenger of Allah would inspire the believers with hope. In the midst of the storm of terror, he stood steady as a mountain, unwavering in his objective. The Prophet of Allah was always upbeat. Importance in of Al-Aqsa During previous Ramadans, the Israeli military attacked Al-Aqsa, the third holiest place for Muslims. This is why the location is so essential in the Islamic faith. Al-Aqsa, which means farthest or the supreme in Arabic, is a mosque in the center of Jerusalem's old city. Muslims of all sects regard it as the third holiest location after Mecca and Medina. The Al-Aqsa Mosque appears numerous times in the Quran. For instance, in chapter Al Isra, verse 17, 1 says, Glory be to him who carried his servant by night from Al Mashid al Haram to Al Mashid al Aqsa, the environs of which we have blessed, that we may show him some of our signs. He is indeed the hearing and the seeing. The scripture refers to Prophet Muhammad's night journey from Medina to Mashid al Aqsa in Jerusalem, where he conducted prayers before being carried through space by a celestial steed to meet with the divine. According to Islamic scriptures, Prophet Muhammad's meeting with the divine occurred outside of time and space. He was magically transferred from Mecca's Mashid al-Haram to Jerusalem's Mashid al-Aqsa from where he ascended to paradise. The Prophet's ascension occurred after a period of intense suffering and pain from his tribe and family. He and his companions were frequently mocked, humiliated, and oppressed for following God's teaching. Many Quranic verses and hadiths refer to various aspects and attributes of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Only two mosques are mentioned by name in the Quran, Mashid al-Haram in Mecca and Mashid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. It also refers to Al-Haram, the sacred Kaaba's surrounding region where Muslims from all over the world meet, worship, and circle the house of God. Similarly, the Quran refers to Al-Aqsa Mosque as the center of Beit i maqdis which translates as the Holy Land and the Land of Baraka, or the Land of Salvation and Peace. Al-Aqsa and its surroundings are characterized as blessed in the Quran. The word blessed land refers to a place over which God has bestowed physical and spiritual bounties from which all creation can benefit, according to the Islamic worldview. Prophecies in Times of Hardship When the Prophet and Abu Bakr were on their way from Makkah to Medina, they were pursued by the Quraysh, who were commanded by their most expert tracker, Surka B. Malik. Suraka was hoping for a bounty that had been placed on their heads. He was the only one who came near to capturing the Messenger of Allah and Abu Bakr, but whenever he came across them, his horse would sink knee-deep into the sand. After this happened three times, he realized that the Messenger of Allah was safe and that he would be unable to capture him. He requested Allah's Messenger to ask Allah to let him go in exchange for telling the Quraysh that they, too, would be unable to catch them since they were under Allah's protection. Allah asked the messenger, and Allah accepted his request. Sirka requested that the Prophet offer him a written note as security, which he received. During this time, the messenger of Allah was anticipating the fall of the mighty Persian Empire. To take a minute to reflect, the Persian Empire was one of the most powerful ancient empires. The Persian Empire had already existed for hundreds of years when Islam arrived on the scene. There was just no comparison in terms of military capability. Nonetheless, the Messenger of Allah went to Sirka and asked, How will you feel when you are wearing the bracelets of Kizra? The Muslims conquered Persia within a decade or two of the death of the Prophet of Allah. The bracelets of Kizra were among the spoils sent to the Kalf of the period, Umar b. Khatib. Recalling the Prophet's words and prophecy, Umar summoned Sirka, who was now elderly and had adopted Islam during the conquest of Makkah. Umar gave Sirka the bracelet and other Kizra artifacts for him to wear, and the Prophet of Allah's vision was realized. The Battle of Kandak 
occurred some years after the migration. It was also known as Azab because nearby Jewish and Arab tribes and factions joined forces with the Qurayshi, polytheists, to attack the Muslims in Medina. Muslims erected trenches to keep the invaders out, and some were terrified by the fact that the entire Arabian Peninsula had gathered against them. When the Messenger of Allah struck a rock three times, a bright light would spark each time. He remained positive and restated Allah's promises. According to another account, it was like a light in the middle of a dark night. This is evidence that the three sparks appeared with each strike. The Messenger of Allah stated, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys to Damascus. I swear by Allah that I see the red palaces of Damascus now. On the second strike, he said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys to Persia. I swear by Allah that I see the city of Madian, of the Kors Rose, and his white palace. Then on the third strike, he said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys to Yemen. I swear by Allah that I see the gates of Sana now. The hypocrites among them would emphasize and concentrate on the fact that they, the Muslims, were under siege, whereas the Prophet of Allah spoke of dominating the world. It served to bolster the faith of the believers. These joyful tidings demonstrated to them that whatever happened during the struggle, the Ummah was destined for greater things. Of course, we know that within two decades or so, the Prophet of Allah's vision was realized, and all of the places indicated came under the control of Islam. At times, the Messenger of Allah made decisions for future generations rather than his own. Consider the Mikt as an example of this. Dul Hulefa was designated as the Mikat for the people of Medina, Al Jufa for the people of Shim, Karn Al Manazil for the people of Najd, and Yalamlam for the people of Yemen by Allah's Messenger. There was no Muslim community in the direction of Persia, Syria, or Yemen when the Messenger of Allah established these mock, but the Messenger of Allah demonstrated he was a visionary by believing a time would come when Islam and Muslims would reach every corner of the world. Jerusalem Prophecy The recent announcement concerning the status of Jerusalem and its designation as a capital of the illegal and occupying state of Israel by Donald Trump and the American administration is in the words of Malaysian Defense Minister Hisham Muddin Hussein, a slap in the face of the Muslim world. It demonstrates how vulnerable the Ummah's position is. It is quite simple to become depressed in this situation. However, the preceding examples show that the Messenger of Allah would use such periods to promote hope, and it is thus an appropriate appropriate time to recall the predictions concerning Jerusalem. According to Abdullah B. Hawala al-Adzi, the Prophet placed his palm on my head and stated, Ibn Hawala, if you see that the Caliphate has taken abode in the sacred land, then the earthquakes and tribulations and great events are at hand. The last hour on that day will be closer to people than my hand is to your head. Yunus B. Masera also relates that the Prophet said, This matter will be after me in Medina, then Al-Sham, then Jazira, then Iraq, then in the city, then in Al-Quds. If it is in Al-Quds, its home country is there, and if any people expel it, it will not return there ever. Abdi al-Rahman bi Abdi Umayra relates that the Prophet said, There will be an oath of allegiance according to guidance in Al-Quds. These are the very great path. What we may conclude from these is that not only will Jerusalem be liberated, but the seat of the Caliph will be erected in the area as well. The particular arrangement of locations described in one of the preceding adages is extremely remarkable. We know that the Kilfa began in Madna and then moved to Shim Syria during the hegemony of the Umayyads. The next stated location, Jazira, encompassed the areas that are now known as Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, including cities such as Mosul and Raqqa, which were the principal centers for the Umayyad Kilfa of old, and Haran. During the reign of the Umayyad Caliph, Hishim b Abdi al Malik made Rasafa, which includes the Raqqa area, his home place, where he built multiple palaces. The city of Haran then became the headquarters of the Kilfa ranging from Spain to Central Asia during the reign of Marwan II until it was destroyed and looted by the Abbasids in 750. Raqqa and Haran were both located in the Jazira region, indicating that Jazira was the Umayyad's temporary seat during their final years. The Abbasids, who made Baghdad their imperial capital, fulfilled the next site named Iraq. Many academics believe that the allusion to the city refers to Heraclius's city of Constantinople, which of course became the capital of the Uthmi Kilfa. This leaves only one city, Al-Quds, Jerusalem. The Kilfa has never been in Jerusalem during Islam's illustrious history. Salhuddin, who liberated Jerusalem from the barbarous crusaders, was not the caliph of the Muslims. Instead, he was bestowed with the title of Sultan, who himself swore allegiance to the Abbasid. In any case, his base was Damascus, not Jerusalem. Looking back through Islamic history, we can see that neither a godly leader nor a daring liberator develops, unless there are pious men and scholars present to instruct and advise them 
and face their challenges. The Prophet of Allah and the Sahaba, whom he developed and nourished, are evident examples. Leadership has numerous components, all of which the Messenger of Allah possessed. Among these was the ability to motivate, inspire, and give hope, which is sadly lacking in many nowadays. This aspect of leadership may be found in all outstanding figures throughout Islamic history. Consider Salhuddin, who was fostered by the scholar and king Nuruddin Zengi, who set the groundwork for the liberation of Al-Aqsa and inspired Salhuddin. Nuruddin built a magnificent and intricate mimbar in Aleppo in or around 1154, just as the Messenger of Allah did with the Mik. This mimbar was supposed to be installed in Mashid Al-Aqsa, built approximately 30 years before the conquest of Al-Quds by Salhuddin in 1187. The minbar was placed within the Mashid once the liberation was accomplished. Later in life, following the death of Nuruddin, Salhuddin was inspired to complete emancipation by the scholar Bear Adin Bished and was escorted by him in the fights along the road. Muhammad al fatih is another example. This was a guy who, at the age of 12, made the word of Allah imprinted and instilled in his heart, and in particular, Sheikh Samsuddin instilled in his very being the ad of conquering Constantinople, which transformed his life forever. He took Constantinople and thus effectively began the glorious reign of the Ottoman Caliphate. Sheikh Shamsuddin, like many who came before him, fought alongside Muhammad al fatih in the fights along the route. During the Crusades, Ibn Asker wrote his magnum opus, Turk Madnat Damask, History of Damascus, which was the largest biographical dictionary ever written in the medieval period. It is one of the jewels of Islamic historiography, with 74 volumes and six book indices. It praised Syria's holiness by recording the lives and accomplishments of prominent men and women who lived in the region. Ibn Asker's main goal in writing this text and emphasizing the purity of the land was to motivate Muslims to defend it from the Crusaders. Thank you for joining us as we looked into the terrifying predictions of Al-Aqsa. We hope that this video has given you useful insight into the events taking place in the Middle East. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel for more thought-provoking stuff.